Attention, interloper. Heed this recorded message. This drone vessel speaks with the voice and authority of Urquan. You are trespassing within Urquan space. This world, Earth, may not be approached for any reason. Nor will hostilities against our orbital platform be tolerated. In addition, your ship does not respond to standard hierarchy identification transmissions and is therefore deemed to be independent. This is not permissible. Only subservience shall be tolerated. This drone now leaves to inform the Urquan of your transgressions. You are commanded to remain here and await the arrival of the Urquan. Disobedience will be punished. Attention unidentified space vessel. I am Starbase Commander Hayes of the Slave Planet Earth. Our hyperwave broadcast is extremely weak. Situation critical. Energy cores exhausted. Scanners and deep radar are non-functional. We cannot identify your vessel. Are you the scheduled hierarchy resupply ship? Repeat. Are you the resupply vessel? Look, I don't know who you are or why you're here, but right now the only thing I'm worried about is saving the lives of 1900 men and women aboard this starbase, and right now you're our only hope. I can't keep the transmitter on too much longer. We need the power for heat and air, so if you don't have any radioactives on board your vessel, please get some and bring them back here before it's too late. The fastest way to get radioactives in this system would be to land on Mercury and scour the surface for deposits of radioactive elements. But be careful. Mercury is a pretty inhospitable place. Watch out for earthquakes and those high temperature areas. Thanks. I'll make sure to mention this the next time I talk with our masters. I'm sure they will reward you. Thank <laughs> you. 
Did you find any radioactive elements for our power cores? We're initiating transfer of radioactives, Captain. Now, as soon as our engineers can refit the energy cores, there, that's much better. Power ratings are climbing. Life support is coming back into the green. Deep radar systems and sensors are now online, and I can scan your vessel. What the hell kind of ship is that? Just who are you, Captain? Okay, what do you want to know? Urquan slave law requires that we maintain an orbital space platform to assist hierarchy vessels which are in need of repairs or fuel. Since the shield around the Earth cuts us off completely from the planet, we're dependent on the Urquan resupply ships for our non-renewable resources. The resupply vessels are supposed to arrive every five years, at which time the Urquan somehow penetrate the shield and exchange those of us up here with replacement personnel from the surface. When the Alliance lost the war, the Urquan gave Earth a single choice. Join the hierarchy as battle thralls and fight for the Urquan to enslave other sentient species or become fallow slaves and be forever imprisoned on a single world encased in an impenetrable energy shield here on Earth. We choose not to fight for the Urquan. Soon after the Earth accepted the Urquan's oath of fealty, they departed leaving behind a battle group of Spathy and Ilrath ships based on the moon. That was the Urquan security drone. It keeps an eye on us. Captain, what happened to the spy drone? Oh no! Right now it's probably cruising through hyperspace heading right towards the closest hierarchy outpost. When the Urquan find out that you're here, they're going to send a combat fleet instantly. Star Control Science Mission, huh? <laughs> Captain, I served as a Star Control Officer during the war aboard several cruisers in the Corward Front. And if there'd been any scientific mission to Vela, I would have heard about it. Hmm... You know, come to think of it, there were some rumors that Corridor 9, the Special Operations Division of Star Control, was directing some hush-hush operation near Androsynth Space. The Vela Star System, yes, that would be the right direction. So, Captain, if you say it's true, how do you explain that huge alien starship you're flying? And why are you here? What do you want from us? Ah, fight the Urquan. Win back our freedom. I remember having such thoughts myself once, long time ago. That was in the first years after the defeat, when it was still terrifying to look up and see the bloody glow of the pulsating slave shield overhead. Though day and night we gazed up at the impenetrable wall, as though the sheer power of our hatred would pull it down. But over the years I spent so much of my time struggling, down on the surface, under the shield, and then later up here trying to keep the station alive, that I'd forgotten what it means to be free, to hate our Urquan masters. And now here you are, in an alien ship of unknown power offering me your assistance to fight against the hierarchy again after all these years. Captain, your offer is intriguing. It's tempting to think that with your advanced precursor technology we can somehow crack the Earth's slave shield and reassemble the Alliance to attack the hierarchy. And this time, win the damn war. Consider the consequences if you should fail. The Urquan won't just punish us here on the station, they'll exact a gruesome retribution on the surface below as well. Before I commit this station to helping you attack the Urquan and accepting the risk of annihilation if we are defeated, I have to make sure that you and your ship have what it takes to oppose the hierarchy. I'll make you a deal. If you can eliminate the alien base on the moon and get rid of that threat at least, I will seriously consider your offer. After the Urquan erected the slave shield around the Earth and established this space station, they decided to leave a contingent of combat ships close to the Earth to keep watch on our planet and confirm that they were obeying the Urquan slave laws. I'm certain they're still out there on the surface of the moon because we can pick up a constant stream of alien broadcasts.
As I said before, after the Urquan erected the slave shield around the Earth and assembled the space station, they decided to leave a contingent of Spathy and Ilraf ships stationed on the moon. We've looked at the moon base through our telescopes, and we can confirm that there's still substantial activity down there, but we've never been able to make contact with the base using either hyperwave caster or traditional radio signals. Be careful, Captain. There are probably a dozen Spathy eluders and Ilrap Avengers down there on the lunar surface. I don't know why they haven't come after you yet, but when they do, you'd better have your weapons armed and your thrusters burning hot. hot. Have you dealt with the base yet? I'll be darned. All these years we've been listening to their incoherent broadcast and we never even guessed. Captain, listen closely. Long range sensors show a ship closing on this station fast. Our computer identifies it as Ilrath, Avenger class. I think you've got a fight on your hands, Captain. Your best bet is to wait until you have point blank range. Captain, it's jamming our signal. By the fetid breath of the dark twin, Kazan, a human and an alien starship. How fascinating. When I intercepted that Urquan drone and learned that an unidentified starship had approached Earth, uh, I never expected to find such a remarkable vehicle in the hands of a human. Humans are prey animals, weak and helpless. But here is a human in an armed starship and therefore in direct violation of the Oath of Fealty. I am sure our masters, the Orquan, will punish Earth most severely for this treachery when I present them with the twisted wreckage of your ship and your many charred corpses. As alien as your ship may be, our sensors reveal how few weapons you have on board. Though this vessel is undercrewed and our cloak of darkness is non-functional, we still have more than enough power to kill you all.
What a beautiful sight, Captain. I haven't seen an Avenger blown away like that since the battle in Draco. I guess you've shown that you can handle yourself in battle, Captain. So my last reservation about helping you has been dissolved. I will commit this station to helping free Earth and defeat the Urquan. We may get our atoms rearranged in the process, but by God, Captain, we're going to try. So the obvious first step is to get the precursor equipment and software over here so that we can make it work with our ship repair fabricators. But then what, Captain? A sensible plan, Captain. Let's get to work. Good luck. By the way, Captain, I think we need a name for this new alliance we're going to forge. And since it was your idea, it's only fair that you get the honor of naming it. So, what will it be? Okay, that sounds pretty inspiring. So be it. The new alliance of free stars. Now, Captain, I expect the configuration process for the star base to take at least two weeks, so let's get to work. I have good news to report, Captain. We have successfully integrated the precursor technology from your ship into our fabricator system, and as you can see, we've already begun minor repairs on your ship, patching up some of the micrometeorite holes. We noticed that your ship does not have an emergency warp escape unit, so our engineers rigged up some for you and each of your escorts. Now, you should be able to escape from a bad situation with the touch of a button. But there is a cost, however. The unit gulps up five fuel units each time your precursor ship uses it. Also, we now have a limited capacity to make modifications to your ship, to refine starship fuel, to build additional combat ships, and to train new members of your crew for the flagship and any ships you acquire for your fleet. Captain, I know you're eager to get to work, so I'll be brief. If you have any questions how this star base works, what resources we need, or just some background information on the galaxy, don't hesitate to ask. The more minerals you bring us, Captain, the faster we'll be able to tackle the Urquan. Be careful out there, Captain. Hello, Captain. Certainly, Captain. What do you need to know? We can modify your precursor ship, build additional combat vessels, and supply you with fuel and crew. As you know, Captain, we've committed the entire output of this station to building your flagship and your battle fleet into the strongest force possible. However, our resources are very limited, and we feel you must decide how we are to spend our effort and materials. To aid you in making these decisions, we have implemented a resource allocation scheme. We provide you with a numerical assessment of the station's resources and ascribe a cost to each task we can perform and each device we can build. It's up to you to decide how you're going to spend your resource units, or RU as we call them. To acquire more RU, you must bring resources back to the star base. These resources can be either in the form of mineral ores gathered from planet surfaces or already refined metals and other valuable materials from the wreckage of enemy starships. What else can I tell you? Fine. Is there anything else you need? Bring back lots of minerals, Captain.
Attention, a big, mean, hostile alien vessel hovering overhead in an obvious attack posture. This is Spotty Captain Swizzle. I know you are going to torture me, so let's just get this over with right now. The coordinates of my homeworld, Spatiwa, are 241.6 by 368.7, and the ultra secret Spati Cipher, which is known only by me and several billion other Spati, is Huffy Muffy Duffy. Sorry about that little mistake with your landing vehicle. I was uh, so startled when it approached my vessel in a threatening manner that uh, my automated defense systems fired on it when it got too close. I hope nobody got hurt. Are you sure? Because your statement is often just a more polite way of saying Attention alien vessel! Identify yourself or be destroyed! In any event, I am Spotty Captain Rico of the Voidship Star Runner. Based here in this planetary system as part of the powerful Earth Tower, the Star Force, which our master, the Earth One, established here to make sure the Earthlings don't do anything tricky. Well, I really want to, but I am just not sure that under the present circumstances, joining you in your exciting and also dangerous space adventures would be the best course of action right now, because the Oricon could return at any minute, and the punishment they would bestow on me for such treason would make any other horrible death seem like big fun by comparison. Thanks for the offer, though. Our masters don't really keep us very well informed about their goings on, so that all we know is that immediately after the subjugation of the last alliance race, the Yehat, I think, the Earthworm doubled their dreadnoughts and departed from the edge of the galaxy, commanding us to obey the slave laws or face their wrath when they returned. We only know bits and pieces of what happened to each race. For instance, when defeated, the Yahat joined the hierarchy as combat thralls, while the Cyrene chose to be slave shielded on a planet in the Bug Squirt Star System. No, that's not right. I forget its name. Anyway, where was I? Oh yes, we shall fix it. They were utterly wiped out in a gigantic blaze of glory. The show 60 were half a feral, as you know, having been uplifted by the Yahat just a few decades before the start of the war. Given their habit of detonating those suicidal so-called glory devices in combat, it came as no particular surprise to me when, upon the arrival of the Orphan Primary Task Force at their homeworld, the show 60 caused their sun to explode in a colossal supernova, destroying the entire planetary system, and not incidentally, dozens of <laughs> About 20 years ago, this region of space was dominated by a loose confederation known as the Alliance of Free Stars, which was composed of the aliens native to these parts who did not want to be enslaved. They made a valiant effort against the superior Urquan forces. It even looked like they might miraculously defeat the combined Urquan Armada, right up to the point at which the Urquan totally defeated, indeed annihilated them. 
When the Oricon Armada entered the system to subjugate formerly the Earthlings, the Oricon presented the humans with the standard slave options. Join the hierarchy as combat draws and retain some autonomy including the right to travel through space or become a fellow species and return to a free atomic savagery on the surface of their homeworld and test for all time beneath an impenetrable force shield. The humans chose the latter option, and so were swiftly imprisoned on the surface of Earth. But the Earth one didn't have them to obey the restrictions, so they chose a small group of hierarchy combat starships from the Illith and Spartan fleets to create the so-called Earth Guard and station them at a base on Earth's moon. Originally, we were stationed on Earth's moon, which made us happy a bit uneasy because with each passing day we grew more and more worried about the sneaky Earthlings making a surprise attack. Though the Illyrath kept telling us that it was impossible since the Earthlings had no ships or weapons whatsoever. That made us feel a bit better, but when the Illyrath left, again we grew fearful and decided to make a strategic redeployment to Mars. Later on we decided it would be prudent to relocate to Jupiter's moon, Ganymede, then later Saturn's moon, Titan, and finally here to Pluto. The Illrath contingent were supposed to be the toughest ridge crest, er, uh, the most rigid flipper, no, ah uh, yes, the backbone of the Earth Guard Force. But they departed the system on the mass not long after the last Earth Hundred that vanished from this region of space. They claimed to have received a direct order from their gods of evil and darkness, who had grown dissatisfied with the Inrath's passivity and wanted them to kill, or at least, torture someone soon. Personally, I believe they just got bored and went off to have some fun. Well, when they were pushing up into hyperspace 18 years ago, we asked them that very question, and I think they said something to the effect um, real soon. <laughs> we decided that if the Earthlings figured out we had abandoned the base on the Luna, they would be more likely to try something sneaky. So, we rigged up some old service androids and ordered them to drive around on the lunar surface in bulldozers, endlessly pushing around the same piles of dirt. In addition, we connected the base's local radio transmitter to an audio Melnorme fun rum called Winky's Happy Night, hoping they would think we were still there. Over the past years, it became necessary to redeploy strategically some of our earth guard forces to our homeworld in case of a sudden surprise attack by a vicious, unrelenting alien race which we spotty call THE ULTIMATE EVIL! As yet, the ultimate evil remains largely unmanifest, and its powers and exact intentions are still a bit obscure, since it lurks just outside the range of even the most sensitive long-range detectors, which we feel gives conclusive evidence as to the ultimate evil's nefarious intent. You build a strong case, Captain. Here I am, alone and undefended, on the surface of a hostile alien world. Above me you hover in orbit, encrusted with beam guns, missile launchers, and other more dreadful weapons. So I think to myself, as a whistle, is it prudent to remain here, as vulnerable as a mosling on a skillet? No! I answer myself. Join me, human! He is kind and good! But then a wicked voice whispers, Beware! The human is tricking you. If you join him, you will die alone in the cold of space. And for reasons beyond my understanding, Captain, this voice overwhelms the other. And so I must remain here, largely against my will. Since it was our most powerful and unforgiving master, the Orphan, who stationed us here, we knew it would be grossly stupid to disobey them completely, but 
we decided it would be okay to send just one ship home. We used one of our most ancient and solemn rituals, Poon Taffy, to pick the lucky ship. Then, some months later, we decided that it wouldn't really hurt if we sent one more ship home. And then later we sent another, and then another. Well, you get the idea. Alas, as fate would have it, when the final ritual was performed, I, the Riffle, was left here alone. For as even the most immature in wrestling knows, there must always be one stopper who puts the short top room stick. Dozens, that is to say, scores, and perhaps even hundreds of my brethren stride through the corridors of this specially modified, super-efficient, mass-destruction-oriented starship, which could lay siege to an entire planetary system, should we choose to do so, which, fortunately for you, we have decided not to do today. I am undone! You are far too clever for a poor stuffy like me, and now I must submit to your superior alien intellect. I guess I am not revealing any truly important secrets if I tell you that each of my species' eluder class void ships typically holds 30 stuffy crewmen, though at present my vessel, the Star Runner, is not up to full complement due to the needs of my homeworld in their resistance against the alternate evil. And in fact, my vessel is somewhat understaffed right now, seeing as how I am the only spotter on board, which is a bit frightening, as I am sure you can understand. Me? You mean me, personally? How nice of you to ask! I was born a poor green in crafting, the youngest child of a family of 18,487. My male parents had to work hard to support us, very hard, but each of my brothers and sisters and I tried to help out to make ends meet. The female parent was kind and sweet to all of us. Why, she once even called me by name! She said, a treat, a golden memory. I swiftly matured into a fine example of my species with my parents' assistance, achieved independence, specifically they pried me from the door jam and rolled me into the street. Thus prepared, I set out to make my fortune. I had great dreams in those days, yes, great dreams! I knew that someday I would be vastly rich, wealthy enough to afford a large, well-fortified mansion. Surrounding my mansion would be vast tracts of land, through which I could slide at any time I wished. Of course, one can never be too sure that there aren't monsters hiding just behind the next push, so I would plant trees to climb at regular, easy-to-reach intervals. And being a spotty of the world, I would know that some monsters climb trees, though often not well, so I would have my servants place in each tree. I basket of perfect stones, not too heavy, not too light, just the right size for throwing at monsters. I was thinking about what color the stones would be painted, aqua, mauve, or magenta, when a bit of trouble cart came careening down the street outside my house and left me unconscious. When I awoke, I was aboard the void ship Star Runner headed for Earth. Apparently, I had been out of my head for quite some time after the accident, and with the assistance of some kind strangers, had been relieved of my funds and convinced to join the Navy, where I have been unpleasantly employed for the last 25 years. Twice before you have asked this question, Captain, will the third time be the charm? Alas, I fear not. How true, Captain, how true! In truth, just between us, during the past seven years, I have been quite ill at ease, and yet now I find myself enjoying your company. This witty dialogue, and the presence of your huge, powerful, death-dealing starship, which, being my friend, you would certainly feel compelled to use in order to save me from any hostile life forms who threatened me with death. 
happy days and the jubilation. I discard all prejudice and hesitation and accept and celebrate your offer of protection and your undying commitment to my well-being. I must wax melancholy for just a moment, though. And make sure you understand that any other spotty ships we meet at large in the galaxy are not going to be quite so responsive to your friendly gestures as myself. Since they bear more heavily the yoke of Urquan enslavement and are also apt to talk themselves out of a line with a totally unknown alien, which I, having been left here alone, cannot do. Welcome me aboard, Captain.
of our old enemy, the Hootman. No, the Shootman? No, no, I remember. The Hootman. Aspects of your last statement defy the course of nature as I know it. First, peace, as you call it, is an illusion. If you have peace, you simply haven't yet seen the thing that's trying to kill you. Second, peaceful missions through the cosmos rarely require weapons large enough to punch holes through a small moon. In case you have not forgotten, we are bonded to the Urquan as slaves. The punishment for the plan you propose can be described as death. We can best be described as a metal mollusks, possessing the best qualities of both the clam and the dravat, which is not native to your world. We are intelligent and clever, though you would never call us cunning. Each day, when we awaken, we call forth the traditional stuffy prayer. Oh God, please don't let me die today! Tomorrow would be so much better! I want to live forever, with no pain whatsoever, owning that personal property plus a company of new buyers. If this is in your power to give, I beg of you to do so. This is a sad tale, so do not even try to contain your tears. After the Orkhan demolished the Irrat, they turned the force of their armada against us Asafi. The term rapidly subjugated would best describe what happened next. When the Orkhan arrived at Safiwa, there was a great ceremony. Part of that ceremony involved blasting portions of our planet's surface into radioactive dust, and this part we did not enjoy. But the worst was yet to come. Our leaders were called into the command chamber of Urquan Lord One's Dreadnought, where they were read a long and complicated document explaining the choices given new slaves. When our leaders heard the term forever encased and impenetrable shield, they grew overexcited, I'm afraid, and made a fatal error. The decision was to be transmitted to the Orkhan by one of two rods, one colored black, the other white. Our leader handed the white rod to one of the Orkhan's servants, signifying fellow slavery, but the servant somehow exchanged rods and handed the Orkhan lord a black rod, indicating our desire to become fighting slaves. By the time we learned of the switch, it was too late. The Orquan would not permit a change in status. Following that most tragic day, we were forced to assume the role of an Urquan star thug. We tried to avoid combat, but the Urquan gave us three warnings, each more strident than the last. When we learned that there would be no fourth warning, simply annihilation, we attended to our new role with improved vigor. Oh, and perhaps you have already guessed, the Urquan's servant who made the switch was an Umga. Sure, consider it done. Allies to the bitter end. Not! Look, can we keep this as a secret between the two of us? It's really rather embarrassing. What is the secret cipher? We are the Faith Ones, the Spotty High Council. You have given us the correct cipher, and so you will not be destroyed immediately. 
Now, if you please, tell us how you acquired our most secret Spotty Cipher, which every Spotty swears never, never to reveal, even when threatened with considerable pain. No doubt. No. No. We are too afraid of the Urquan to consider such an alliance. They would most certainly punish us with extreme tortures. Hello? Hello? Awaken from your dreamy state, you them. Now is the time for realism, not wild fancy. Yes, your vessel is unique. And here is the crux of the problem. A unique, meaning singular, starship is not equal to the task of destroying the entire Earth One Armada. If you had, say, 10,000 similar starships, we could take your boasts more seriously. <laughs> well, that would probably work, but I have a better idea. A test. One of those questy kind of things. And must wipe the evil ones from the face of Spatiwa. Let us explain the sad history of our species. Once upon a time, many thousands of years ago, we inhabited the warm, safe surface of our home planet, Spatiwa. We were happy and content. During those golden centuries, we evolved from a primitive nomadic culture into a complex agrarian society. We learned to write on clay tablets, and we were well on to being able to read those tablets when the darkness fell upon us, when the evil ones came. Creatures from the darkest pits of hell they were. They hunted our people, devoured them like tasty nodules, and we had no defense against them. Suddenly, our culture became once more nomadic. We fled across the ocean from continent to continent, but the evil ones always followed. Spurred by our great need, we advanced from bronze to atomic technology in less than one of your centuries. But none of our innovations was a match for the evil ones' natural cunning and ferocity. Finally, with no other option available, we fled our world and took up residence here on our own moon, where we have resided most uncomfortably for the last 300 years. We will await your return with great anticipation. Simultaneously, we will prepare a short, poignant eulogy to mourn your demise.
go, your foolishly courageous and noble efforts to rid the evil ones from our beloved Spatiwa. This is wonderful! Too good to be true! We will immediately begin transporting Spotty from this unpleasant moon down to the safe surface. We shall send in Fusslings and the infirm elderly first as a special honor. Please come back later to receive your accolades. We rejoice and make merry in celebration of our imminent return to our home world. You are most heroic and helpful. Thank you, thank you, thank you! But now I must return to our festivities. Please feel free to come back any time. Why don't you just wait a while until after we are resettled on our home world? We can discuss details at that time. Fifteen years past. No, no, no. We are simply taking a more adult, welcome to the real world view of the situation. We cannot simply say, hurrah, and form an alliance with you this very moment. Surely you see that. No! Uh, no, please. <sighs> Exactly what kind of relationship were you thinking of? Huh? What? Uh, okay. We are quite familiar with that arrangement. Very well. I'll bet we will regret this decision later on, but you leave me with no choice. We will comply with your needs. A spotty delegation will depart immediately for the planet Earth. How wonderful! Very little, I'm afraid. We've just been watching the stars. You know, actually, there was something that happened the last month on the 17th. We saw a new star appear between the Sir Kini and Chandrasekhar star clusters. We watched it and watched it for three days. We just watched it. Then it went away, vanished just like that. I hope it comes back. We used to be bored, but then we bought this cool entertainment product. It simulated a grand adventure through a thousand parsecs of hostile space, where we met interesting aliens, uncovered the secrets of a long-lost superior race, and eventually, to save our world from destruction, we had to face the drag- Never mind, I can tell you aren't really interested. Same to you. Wondering, is Tafayuf still alive? Have you seen him? Is he well? He was sent to your Earth Starbase a while ago to capture an eluder vessel as part of our mutual assistance pact. Rest assured, he will be an excellent addition to your elite force. Those weeks of intense training always result in an officer of the highest caliber. If you see him, please let him know that I still consider his death valid and expect prompt payment. Thank you. Same to you.
We come in peace. This is Pro2418-B, we are on a peaceful mission of exploration, priority override. New behavior dictated, must break target into component materials. I hope the battle fares well, Captain. I know you're busy, but I've got some news. Captain, a delegation of Spathy has just arrived here under orders from their High Council to form an alliance and assist you against the hierarchy. They have provided fabricator blueprint data for their eluder spacecraft and promise a steady supply of captains for as many ships as we build. Excellent work, Captain. Also, we are being bathed in a broad beam hyperwave transmission from the direction of the Rigel star system. Due to the broadcast wide dispersion, we cannot discern its content. Light load this time, Captain. Goodbye, Captain.
profession, Starship. We are the stock pot pit. Make no hostile actions. We come in peace and with goodwill. But if you make one false move, you're vapor. Don't worry. My companion is just a bit nervous. No, I'm not. And argumentative. No, I'm not. We are a scout vessel dispatched from our home world. We have traveled far through hostile, uncharted space to find you. We hail from the Green Dwarf Star at coordinate there far. Aha! Bahoy hoy! No, idiot, in their coordinate system. Oh, uh, <clears throat> coordinates 400.0 by 543.7. Hooray! That we finally found our saviors! Maybe. At last, our search is over. It is just as the great crystal ones promised. They were sneaky. I think they're lying. Quiet, fool. Can't you see our nightmare is over? This ship is from the great crystal one's fable alliance. The alliance of three stars. Maybe. In our ancient past, Four species evolved intelligence on our homeworld. Simultaneously. They were the Zok, the Fot, the Pit, and the Zabran. We three, the Zok, Fot, and Pit, evolved in such a way as to acquire sustenance from many sources. From airborne yellow plankton. From solar and ambient energy. And from rocket fungal cleaners. Our favorite. The Zabranki also consumed a variety of foods, namely the Zok, the Fox, and the Pit. To survive the predations of the Zabranki, we banded together, annihilated the Zabranki, and formed the cooperative union you now encounter. We are a relatively peaceful group of species. Unless we're angry. So, we find ourselves in need of help. We only need a little because of our desperate situation. Desperate is too strong a word. I think troublesome is more like it. Our planets are under attack from an invading horde. We do not know who they are or why they are here. We are being blown to bits. Fleets of alien ships appear out of nowhere, then unleash terrible destructive energy. Fortunately, they release these energies on each other. Unfortunately, they favor combat near strong gravity wells. Their spray shots regularly strike the surface of our planet, often with tragic results. Fortunately, they have never found our homeworld, only our colony planets. Unfortunately, all our colonies have perished as a consequence. Some of the vessels are huge green battleships which launch wave after wave of small fighters. The other ships are black as space and their hulls are carved with strange alien writing. In combat, the two ships seem evenly matched. One fires blasts of fusion energy while the other launches spinning projectiles. These are the words we have prayed for. Hey, this trip's not a waste after all. More than anything, we seek an ally to help us survive in this hostile universe. We're having some problems of that general nature. But we are only emissaries. We must meet with our leaders. They are wiser, more powerful beings. They look just like us, though. Fly to the star called Alpha Tucane. The planet closest to the sun is our home. And if possible, hurry!
offspring has returned to its nest. When you left this system, our ship was near enough to detect your translation into hyperspace. Though we lost your hyperspace spore, we were able to backtrack your path here to this star system. And what did we find? An outlaw culture. Humans outside of a slave shield. You will note that this oversight has been rectified. Now we shall finish the job.
Wow. Welcome back, Captain. Before we proceed, I wanted you to know a previously unknown alien race has recently made contact with our base. They call themselves the Melnorme, and they're anxious to initiate trading relations with us. If we are interested, they suggest making a rendezvous at Alpha Centauri. Another small load, Captain. Well, I suppose something is better than nothing. We shall await your return, Captain.
I am Tree Master Greenish, in command of the Melno May Starship, inevitably successful in all circumstances. I bid you a formal welcome, Captain. Though we Melno May have just recently arrived in this region of space, we have long desired to make contact with your species and look forward to an extended, profitable relationship. Even before our first meeting, we knew of you, Captain. Though your struggle to free Earth shall be a long and difficult challenge, fraught with great danger and mystery, we have great confidence in you and your abilities. We gather information from a thousand secret sources in space and time. Our charge for revealing even one of these sources would be so high that your species would be in debt to us for centuries. Our origins and purposes are frankly mysterious and due to several unavoidable factors we are unable to discuss ourselves in any great detail. First and foremost among these factors is our unwillingness to give away information about our history, psychology, and mental powers, our unique physiology, the exact locations of home worlds, or our potentially ominous long-range plans. However, these important and relevant pieces of information are available for a nominal sum of credits. Yes, let us get down to business. Since this is your first time trading with us, let me explain how our system works. We are interested in purchasing certain items, specifically biological data on alien life forms, and the coordinates of certain strange worlds whose radiant energies defy all scanners, producing a rainbow-like image. In exchange, we have many interesting and valuable commodities, such as fuel, compatible with your starship's hyperdrive thrusters, technological specifications, allowing you to build new devices for your ship, and many important secrets which may help you in your travels. To facilitate trade, we translate all your sales into interstar credits, with which you may make purchases. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Now, what can we do for you today? That's a good question, with a very interesting answer. The fee for this information is 12 million credits. You need credits to purchase our trade items. To earn credits, you must sell us the items we desire, which are biological data on alien life forms and the coordinates of certain strange worlds whose radiant energies defy all scanners, producing you. What would you like to sell, Captain? The 32 units of biological data we downloaded from your ship earn you 64 credits. What trade items would you like to buy today? Investment. Ah, yes. You are so right. These technological breakthroughs don't cost you credit. They earn you credit. Of course, there is an initial charge. 
but each technological system item is guaranteed to be useful for something important somewhere in the galaxy at some point in the future. All technologies cost 150 credits. The technology we are now offering includes plans for building blaster weapons twice as powerful as your ion bolt guns. What else would you like to buy? As you know, we carry a large supply of fuel on board, which is compatible with your engine system. We will be happy to sell this substance to you at a cost of one credit per fuel unit. How much fuel do you wish to purchase? Who would you like to purchase? Anything else? It has been a pleasure dealing with you, Captain. We look forward to your next visit.
I'm at your disposal, Captain. Excellent work, Captain. Try to avoid getting gruesomely killed, Captain.
It is the alien from the Congestus Alliance. Just look at those weapon pods on his ship. We hope that during this visit, we can make clear to your species the benefits of a mutual assistance pact. But we're also armed to the teeth, so don't try stealing our atmosphere or anything sneaky like that. Wonderful! We accept! Hooray! How marvelous! Yeehaw! Captain, we are delighted that your people have made this choice. Now we won't get slaughtered. In exchange for our cooperation helping you with captains and ship designs, all that we ask for is your protection. So we don't get slaughtered. We shall begin fulfilling our commitment at once. We will transport officers and our stinger design to your base immediately. Why, heck! Maybe I'll even make the trip to your planet. I'd make a good starship, Captain. Captain, I'm pretty darn mean in a fight, and there ain't nobody better than me with a thrusty stinger tongue attack. We had a close call last week. One of those black ships was snooping around the system. But before it got to our world, some of the green ships warped in, destroyed the black vessel, and then left immediately. We got lucky. No, we have nothing new to report. Nope, not a thing. Sure, what do you want to know? Just ask away. Not much, to tell the truth. This space exploration stuff is, uh, kind of new to us. Besides the green alien ship, which have only tried to kill us, and the black alien ship, which have actually been quite successful at killing us. The only other starships we have encountered are strange, tumbling red probes, which profess to be on a peaceful mission. But then attack like slavering the Brankies. We believe that the probes are actually robotic scouts, which have suffered some kind of malfunction resulting in their aberrant behavior. And what's worse, they are multiplying. Yes, that's true. The probes seem to be replicating at a geometric rate. Hey! That means if there was only one last week, then next month... Uh, wait a minute. Let me calculate. Uh, uh, that means next month there'll be a whole mess of those things. By backtracing the probe's course path, we have been able to calculate that the source of the probes is somewhere on a direct line that includes our star and Epsilon Muscae. Go get them, Captain! Ah, cultural exchange. A good idea. Yeah, let's tell them about Frungi. Be quiet, you fool. He asked a serious question. He doesn't want to know about Frungi. How do you know? What makes you so smart? You never even asked him if he wants to know about Frungi. Why, I bet right now he's wondering, what is this wonderful sport, Frungi? How is it played? What kind of equipment do you need to play Frungi? And I wonder who's ahead in the Frungi championships. Ah, would you shut up about Frungi? If you say another word about that stupid game, I'm going to lose control and blow a cloud of spores at you. Yeah. Okay, okay. Don't blow your stack. I won't mention Frungi again. I promise. Well, Captain, as you can probably see, our culture's predominant trait, its greatest strength and weakness, is the diverse interactions between Zot, Fot, and Fit. Frungi, Frungi, Frungi! The Stinger is the peak of our technological prowess. It's totally awesome! These vessels are cheap to build and can be quite effective in short-range combat. They turn on a, on a, well, a small round thing that's real small. Remember, though, against most ships, the Stinger must close distance immediately and give unrelenting tongue attacks until either the enemy or the Stinger are destroyed. Yeah, the tonguing is the best part! Nope. Not a word. Anything else? Goodbye, Captain. See ya.
consider us the enemy? These conclusions are flawed. We are your salvation. We bring peace. A peace built upon our social framework, imposed upon your planet. A new world order in which your prosperity and security are assured by the Urquan. We will protect you from the hazards of this hostile universe, from dangers so hideous, your simple minds cannot imagine their dark scope. Today, we are the enemy. In time, this will change. Soon, you will come to understand the boon of slavery we force upon you, and then you will reveal and even love us for this gift. Launch, 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 fighters! Urquan Core R. 
We cleanse our destiny. You will soon die. Make whatever rituals are necessary for your species. My trophy bone pit. In here is one skeleton from each of the races which I personally exterminated. I fondle these bones and recall the fine cleansing. Perhaps your bones will grace this pit momentarily, unless they are accidentally vaporized. We bring greetings from our cranberry species. Remote probe program to replicate. Record data. Contact alien species priority override. New behavior dictated. Must break target into component materials.
Yes, you am. I was just wondering, is Tuffy a stick to As you wish, our waste recycling unit is at your disposal. There you will find quantities of methane, sulfurous gas, and some interesting organic compounds. Feel free, take all you want. But as we are here out in deep space, we learn little of interest. I suggest you consult the more interesting folk at Spatula. Same to you. How nice to see you again, Captain. Now, what can we do for you? Today. What great items would you like to buy today? How much fuel do you wish to purchase? Fuel transferred to your vessel. How much fuel do you wish to purchase? Fuel transferred to your vessel. How much fuel do you wish to purchase? Would you like to purchase anything else? Very well then. We appreciate your intentions, but you have nothing we wish to buy. It has been a pleasure dealing with you, Captain. We look forward to your next visit. Ah, Captain, I'm glad you're back. I have some information I think you should hear. It would appear your diplomatic efforts have struck gold, Captain. We've been contacted by a race called the Zot Fot Pick, who wish to fulfill their part of the unification, something you have arranged with them, I gather. They have sent us specifications for the Stinger-class attack vessels, as well as a large number of Zot Fot Pick commanding officers. You're doing a fine job, Captain. Not a bad job, Captain. Try to avoid getting gruesomely killed, Captain.
This is a system message from ship's computer translation subsystem. Incoming message, extremely unusual in composition. Translation includes many lingual anomalies. Overall accuracy of translation is unknown. Hello, extremely. I hope you like to play. Some campers are not so good for games. Is it time for playing yet? Yes, of course. Difficulty. Problems are difficult. Let's be special together. Spicy games are always fun. Who are you? You are not oars. We are oars. Oars are happy people energy from the outside. Inside is good. So much good that oars will always germinate. Can you come together with oars for party? Yes, yes. We are too friendly. Extremely happy sisters should correct each other for celebration. So much enjoyment. Shall we come to your house so that we can be relatives? Jumping peppers. This is smiley time. You are campers after all. We will start alliance parties for better enjoyment.
I am squirting nice colors. Why? The reason. Camper friends have come to Jalo Playground. Why are you coming to this? You are asked if oars are upset. Oars are not upset. You are happy campers. Certainly, you are only slow time walkers. It is not fun on the surface in slow time. If you want to go, that is okay.
campers like to say hello when they smell the oars. We have learned this. It is no function, but oars want to make campers happy every day. Okay. Hello. Now you are happy, I am sure. That is funny. You think you see oars, but oars are not like reflections. Maybe you think oars are many bubbles, too. It is such a joke. Oars are not many bubbles like campers. Oars are just oars. I am oars. I am one with many fingers. My fingers reach through into heavy space, and you see oars bubbles, but it is really fingers. Maybe you do not even smell. That is sad. Smelling pretty colors is the best game. Yes, we do. Goodbye is the game. Hello, I am only joke. It is funny enough. Do not forget to enjoy the sauce. I am expanding! Yes!
Hello, Captain. There's something I think you should know. We have been invaded by an alien race calling themselves the Oars, though so far the invasion is a friendly one. The fish-like creatures have been stomping around the base in their robotic, walking exoskeletons, which look like combat vac suits, if you ask me. Based on the summary reports I've seen on their Nemesis ship design, I have but a single comment. I like it. I'd say we have quite a nasty little surprise in store for the Urquan the next time you tangle with them. Also, we have a major situation, Captain. As of a few days ago, all Spathy Starship Captains have vanished from our starbase. We don't know how or why, but until we receive replacements from Spathywa, you will be unable to commission any additional Spathy eluder vessels for your fleet. Also, in the log of your voyage from Unzervald, I read that you encountered a tumbling red probe that attacked the Tober Moon, killing Captain Burton. Over the past few months, we have monitored an increasing number of these probes entering the system, and I'm afraid their population seems to be growing geometrically. If this continues, in a year, space will be crawling with these things. I recommend you treat this as a serious problem now, before it becomes a disaster. Discover who is producing these probes and stop them from creating any more.
This will really help, Captain. The analysis reads as follows. Subject to ALO device. Data, whoever the Taelo were, they were clever, way past us, probably even beyond the Chen Jesu. As far as I can tell, with all our equipment, this thing is a rock. Just a rock. Nothing but a rock. However, if you feed a current into it, anywhere along its surface, everyone on board this star base who has Esper potential gets a bad headache. Well, we checked a bit more into that, and when the Taelo thing is active, all evidence of Psycon interaction is flatlined. Nothing gets through. Summary. If you keep this Taelo rock device thing on board your vessel, I'll bet you're immune to any form of psychic attack, or at least mostly immune. That's the end of our scientist's report. Be careful out there, Captain. Do not fear. We shall not harm you. Pending alien contact subroutine priority override. New behavior dictated. Must break target into component materials.
This is Pro 2418-B on a peaceful mission. According to internal monitors there are no malfunctions, priority override. New behavior dictated. Must break target into component materials.
Hello, my little one. I am so pleased to see you. You have done well for yourself. It is gratifying. I forget myself. Of course you don't know me. You are from Unservault, not Earth. We are, however, how shall I say, related. It has been many of your years since I have been to our planet Earth. We are known among your kind by many names, some of them flattering, some of them not. The one we use most often was given to us by the children of the Celts, a wonderful culture. They called us the Arilu, the Arilu Lalile. More recently, we were part of the Alliance of Three Stars, along with your kind until we decided to return to our own, oh, how would you say, reality, when it became clear that your people would be safe enough under the Urquan Slave Shield. We are many places at many times. This place is an easy place. One of the ten easy places. At different times, we explore different easy places. That is our way. Oh, I can see from the look in your eyes that I have confused you. I am silly. Please disregard my words. We seek to trap Noong, but they dark and leap. You cannot trap Noong. Do not even try. I do not think you can even touch them. You are not quite solid enough. Why, we let them go, of course. None of them do not like to be confined. Captain, these things we talk about, they are unimportant to you. They are as dreams. Our words should address your universe, not ours. You are curious. That is a promising quality. How can I describe our relation to humans? Never doubt our motives, Captain. Your well-being is a paramount concern to every army. Surely you know that it was the day after humanity joined the Alliance of Three Stars that we appeared in the open for the first time. This was no coincidence. We wanted to protect you. Once we saw that you were, well, safe, we decided to tend to other business for a short while. Believe me, Captain, we have known each other very long time. You might even say that we knew the first human. With ships and weapons, blood and bones, no. Too many shipmates were forcibly discorporated in the last conflict. Our cooperation is not necessary. You are the focus. However, knowledge transcends reality parameters, and this we can share with you. An example, to discover the nature of the red probes, see creatures who inhabit a world with no surface. Farewell, child. Clever Ward has found our nook in time. You are the first brave human. No others have made the trip. This is our homeworld, Folly Alarophily, nestled safe in this true space eddy. 
The portal you pass through is a rarity, a natural point of interdimensional fatigue. We use these phenomena to speed our transit through the realities. We are wondering, have you met with the Ungar recently? We entrusted an injured talking pet into their care, and we were curious about its progress. As you know, we live in a dimension adjacent to hyperspace, which we call quasi-space. Our ships move between these dimensions through weaknesses in the interdimensional fabric. Although many such weaknesses, or portals, exist which lead from our dimension, quasi-space, to various locations in hyperspace, there is only one naturally occurring portal which will transport a ship from hyperspace to quasi-space. We therefore find it convenient to generate our own portals artificially with focused dimensional fatigue rays. As a sign of our long-standing relationship with your species, we would happily fit your vessel with a portal spawner of its own. But your ship is so massive, our units would be ineffective. However, we suspect you may find a sufficiently powerful warp pod, the key element in a portal spawner, in the wreck of the Earth Corn Dreadnought on the seventh world at Alpha Bobonis. Bring that warp pod back here, and we will prepare a portal spawner for your vessel. We are an endlessly curious species, and we spend much of our time on, how should I say, reconnaissance missions. During one such trip, we witnessed the crash landing of an Urquan Dreadnought on the surface of Alpha Pavonis 7. Normally, when an Urquan vessel is disabled, it automatically engages self-annihilation circuits to prevent other species from learning the Urquan's technological secrets. In this case, however, these circuits must have failed. The Dreadnought did not disintegrate on impact. We landed to explore the wreckage, and were amazed to find a survivor, a talking pet. As you may know, the Urquan used these non-sentient creatures for the task of interspecies translation, a task the Urquan find ultimately demeaning. The talking pet was severely injured, and we did what we could for the poor creature. But it grew clear that without superior measures, the talking pet would die. We turn to the Unga, whom we have known for many centuries. Their bioscience skills are far superior to our own. The Unga promised to do what they could and let us know how the pet fared. We have not heard from the Unga since. Perhaps if you are traveling through their stars, you can ask them for us. Forgive us if we forget the importance you attach to such events as this. Our context is infinitely broader than yours in scope, both in space and time. Nevertheless, to please you, I shall try to recall. Yes, now I remember. Here is the sequence. The Urquan fleets have moved through your solar system, and you are defeated. Your people make the choice not to fight with and for the Urquan. A shield is cast about your world. Your people are now safe. This makes us happy. The Armada departs your star system and moves toward the remaining Alliance members, ourselves, the Cyrene, the Yehat, and their adopted Shofixti. The Yehat and Shofixti withdraw to Delta Gorno, but they do not permit the Cyrene to follow. We are content with the flow of events and leave the area to return here. From our perspective, this sequence of events ends here. Soon after the Urquan defeated the Yehat, and imprison the Cyrene and Beetlejuice, their siblings arrive to initiate the doctrinal conflict. This battle continues as we speak. You desire honesty. It is given. We have visited your world for many thousands of years into your species past. We have changed things, made modifications. Our motives are multiple, our desires complex. Part of what we do on Earth is for your own protection. There are parasites, creatures who dwell beyond. They have names, but you do not know them. 
They would like to find you, but they are blind to your presence, unless you show yourself. The Androsynths showed themselves, and something noticed them. There are no more Androsynths now, only ores. No. In a way, ignorance is your armor, your best protection. They cannot see you now. They cannot smell you. Much of our work with your people involved making you invisible, changing your smell. If I tell you more, you will look where you could never look before. And while you are looking, you can and will be seen. You do not want to be seen. Goodbye, clever child. Hello, visitor. We are the Slylandro. I am content to hover, a Slylandro speaker. Your presence here fills us with excitement. We have gotten so few visitors over these many drawn. We hope you can stay to talk with us for a time. Oh, this is terribly exciting! We will be happy to tell you about ourselves if you will please, please do the same. You see, we Slylandro have been extremely interested in learning about the galaxy, but our physique makes us incapable of leaving our gas giant home. Therefore, we are totally reliant on our infrequent visitors to keep us informed about events outside this planetary system.